Thank you very much. And welcome to you all. Great you're all here on the Saturday morning in the big room. The next 30 minutes we'll be, we will be looking at sound. Uh, we were just being introduced. My name is Julian Feitsma. I'm here together with my colleague Wouter de Winter. We both work for Ike Analytics, where we help clients with data science and machine learning. This can be in different kind of fields, which means we constantly have to acquire new domain knowledge. And at the moment, we're doing a project on audio classification for urban sounds. And we thought it would be nice to share s with you some of the things we learned. Um, classifying noise pollution is a growing area of research. Um, There are, there are a few um, public data sets uh, containing urban sounds. DK's 2019 is running at the moment, uh, and we started experimenting with Urban Sound 8K to learn something about how do you classify sound. Uh, a lot of cities have noise uh, conducts. So for example, there are rules when you, you can only uh, operate a jackhammer in weekdays or people are responsible for the noise their dog makes or uh, well this, these are some of the categories you see some of the classes you see here um, most of the sound events are four seconds long and to compare people um, get an accuracy of 82 percent to recognize in these four seconds seconds uh, what what event is in in the, in the clip so, computer vision, image classification has gotten a lot better the last couple of years, thanks to uh, convolutional neural networks and, of course, more data, more computing power. Actually, what, what Tesla is doing with computer vision at the moment for autonomous driving is quite amazing. Um, in image classification, you, try, you, see, you have an image and you try to classify which object is in the image. And for sound, it would be maybe more like video, where, where different things happen in succession. But what we do is we take an event, a, a, very, a very short clip of audio containing an event, and then we try to classify this event. So this presentation is about um, classification rather than detection. So what does the raw data look like? Um, good luck with this. Here you see an example of an audio event. I don't know if somebody can tell um, what's being shown here. This is what you look when you zoom in. Uh, one thing to notice is that we, we normalized all the samples, so the maximum amplitude is one. If the sound is working, I will try to... We, we, we're going to listen what's actually in here. So, there is the sound of a siren, an ambulance or a police car, but there's also a lot of background noise. Um, the question is how we're going to tackle this problem, and to solve this, we will switch to a different representation. We make use of a Fourier transform. Um, you take a small window in time, and then you map it to the frequency domain, and you look for every frequency bin, how much energy there is in this bin. The, the window we use for the Fourier transform we used is about uh, between 20 milliseconds and 85 milliseconds. So there's a few things you have to consider. How long uh, are you going to take this window? And also we used overlap. We used 50% uh, overlap and 75% overlap. Um, so that's the length and the hop length. And then we make a MEL spectrogram, which is a power uh, density, a spectral density, where you sample points um, on equally spaced time and frequency. And this frequency we do on a MEL scale, which is a log logarithmic scale, and it lets you compare sounds. It's, it's um, comparable to what the human hearing does. This is an example of the same thing we, we just listened to <laughs> for um, um, it's the, the siren, the, the male spectrogram of a siren. You can see the siren in the middle, and in the lower part of the image, you see the noise. 
So let's look at it again and hear and listen. So you can see the, the, the tone actually going up and down. To make these spectrograms we use Librosa, which lets you handle audio files, you can load in an audio file. We used a sample rate of 24 kilohertz for the audio files. And then you can convert it into a MEL spectrogram. There's a few parameters you have to tune. There's the number of MEL bands. And this, this will translate into the vertical dimension of the image. And then you have the length of the Fourier window and also the hop size which translates into the horizontal dimension. And this is what you end up with. This, this, these are the pictures we, f we feed into the neural net. One thing to notice, which is different from images, is, is that the, <coughs> the axes have different meaning. So on the, on the horizontal axis we have time, and on the vertical axis we have frequency. And this turns out to be sometimes it's, it's important to, to keep in mind. Um, here are a picture to show the influence of the Fourier window. Um, if you take a bigger window, you have more information in the frequency domain, but then you end up with less time bins. So it's a trade-off between um, a high resolution in frequency or, or in time. This can be a hyperparameter of your model, but it means if you change this parameter, also the input of your neural, neural net changes. Here you see examples of uh, MEL spectrograms. These are all taken from Urban 8K. So these are the pictures we fed into the neural net. We also make use of uh, another type of features. So normally an image has a, a red, blue and green um, input channel. So we had the MEL spectrogram in the first channel, in the red channel. And we will add, or we added a second uh, feature channel uh, like behind it with the same dimensions. Librosa, Librosa has a delta feature. This is a local estimate of the derivative and this, this may contain extra information which, which isn't captured in the melgram. And we found that, that using the delta features uh, it, it improved things a little bit. The accuracy went up a few percent using the, the delta features. So then the input shape is the, is the um, number of MEL bands by the number of time bands times 2. This is what goes into the neural net. Here you see examples of the delta features. So this also contains some extra information. Um, some differences with normal images. Um, sound and, and images do not... Uh, accumulate in the same manner. If, if the hot dog, uh, the picture of the hot dog, if the hot dog lies on the table, it hides part of the table. But if a police car with a siren passes, it mixes with uh, street noise. So in the, mel in the melgram on the right we just looked at, one pixel can belong to different sources. On the left you see a clean signal, you also see the harmonics of the, of the siren. So there's a few waves uh, which show the harmonics. Uh, there is a way to make use of this transparency, and that's called between-class learning. Instead of feeding the network the sound of a dog or the sound of a cat, we feed it part, part cat, part dog. So we pick two random uh, training examples. And then we, mi we mix them with a random factor. And, um, so, you, for example, you have the, the meow of a cat and uh, the bark of a dog. And then in the, in the lower picture you see the mixture of the two. And with a factor of 0.7, um, <clears throat> the label becomes 70% dog, 30% cat. And actually what we did is, oh, maybe I should say... We can do this linear combination because we normalized the, the audio files. And what we did is we took a linear combination of the MEL spectrograms, which makes it easy to use in the generator. So 
Um, you, take an, you take a random uh, male spectrogram, multiply with a random factor, and then you take a second male spectrogram and multiply it by one minus the factor. And you do the same with the uh, labels. And this helps quite a lot. It's a form of data augmentation. And we found if, when we were making the model deeper, so when we had a more powerful model, the, um, the 9,000, the nine the over 8,000 uh, samples from Urban 8K was just not enough data, so we needed the augmentation, and between class learning um, improved the results by a few percent. What more data aug augmentation can you do? So we looked at between class learning. You can also uh, intentionally add background noise. A third one is time stretching or compressing. This, this didn't prove very effective. Um, it can improve the, some classes, the accuracy on some classes, but it hurt performance on other classes. So let's let, look at the, the last two. Um, there's pitch shifting. In the image, the whole signal moves up or down a little bit. Um, Librosa has a, has a feature for this to, to pitch shift your features. And we, we found that um, uh, working with three different kind of pitch shifts improved our results over uh, no augmentation. This is, this is from a very recent paper. In this augmentation, you randomly block some frequency bands and some time bins. And the position and the width of the band is randomly chosen. Um, and this is very effective in that it turns an uh, overfitting problem into an underfitting problem. We actually had to remove all the dropout layers from the network because the effect was so severe. You can think of it as as uh, preventing the model from, for example, learning that a certain class always needs three harmonics. So um, this, this is a technique. Uh, we didn't experiment with it a lot, but, but it, 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 is, it looks uh, promising. Uh, other differences. If you have a dog in the lower part of the picture and you move the dog, it's still a dog. But <laughs> <laughs> but the, the same pattern in a male spectrogram, if you move it to a different position, it can be a completely different thing. On the left you see an, an engine that's idle, and on the right, uh, it, well, more or less the same pattern is a metro passing. So Wouter's going to tell you a little bit about how we make use of this property in the network. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take over from here, um, uh, and um, we're going to look at, at how we can structure the, the network to make a full use uh, uh, of, of that property of sound. That it really matters on which frequency bin, on which vertical location of the, of the image uh, or, the, or the feature set we're, we're looking at. So, um, first a little bit about max pooling, uh, probably to, to a lot of you uh, a, a technique that you, uh, that you use. It's very common in, uh, um, in, uh, in, in Im image recognition networks, and what it actually does, it discards spatial information, uh, which is usually a good thing uh, because it, uh, uh, yeah, it really helps in, in reducing the computational uh, uh, load on your, uh, on your model. It makes it, it makes it a lot smaller. So what it, what it does, uh, for, for, for people that, that don't know it, it takes uh, uh, small squares of, uh, uh, of the feature set and it just takes the maximum of each of the squares and it puts into a new, uh, into a new vector. So it, it, reduces the, uh, it, yeah, it, it reduces the number of parameters, it reduces the, the data. Um, average pooling works kind of the same and has the same effect in, in, in terms that it reduces the, the spatial information. Uh, but this is something that we, that we don't necessarily want in, in audio because it does matter when, uh, uh, when, when a certain pattern emerges on a higher frequency or on a lower frequency. It can mean, it can mean a total different thing. So um, this is a, a part of a, of a normal convolutional network. We have a shape coming in. Uh, the, first one, uh, the first ones would be the, the, the frequency or in a normal network it would be the X or uh, the Y, uh, where we have the, have the time coming in, and we have the, the channels. 
Um, so only two channels, uh, that was delta and, uh, and the mouse spectrograms in our case. Uh, we have convolutional uh, layers, a few of them stack together, and we end up with a, uh, with a vector that has a lot of channels and, and just a limited amount of spatial information. Um, yeah, we start with a, with a, with a pretty large uh, time window, so it also remains, we have 32 uh, positions left on, uh, on, the, on the time window there. Then there's a, a global max pooling uh, uh, done, and we only end up with a shape of 128 uh, 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 yeah, data points. Uh, then comes the, uh, the dense layers and, uh, and a soft max to eventually come up with a, with a classification. So this is what, what we would normally do, and this also works on, on sound. It, it works quite well, actually, but there is a slightly better way, uh, and that's doing this. So instead of um, doing the global max pooling, we only do a max pooling over the time dimension. Uh, so we, uh, we are going to skip all the time information, uh, uh, but we're going to keep the frequency information. And we're going to keep it by just using a flatten uh, instead of the global max pooling or, glo or global average pooling. So we end up with a bigger shape that still contains the uh, frequency information. Uh, and the dense, the, the dense layers can, uh, can make use of that and uh, yeah, uh, exploit the fact that it, uh, that it knows where it's actually happening. Uh, so this is this is interesting. It, it yeah it it, it adds uh, a few percent to the to the performance. So next thing what we what we did is uh, uh, is an idea that also comes from uh, uh, from from image uh, image classification from uh, from uh, visual computing, um, and that's uh, that's something that is inspired by the inception modules. Um, you probably heard of the inception network, and these ideas uh, uh, work also quite well. Uh, we have a couple of different filters with different dimensions. In our case, uh, it's not really a symmetric filter, but it's, uh, it's an asymmetric filter, so it's a little bit bigger on the, on the time dimension. It's something that you, can, uh, that you can play with. And for the rest, it's a pretty standard inception, inception model that is uh, uh, yeah, designed to be computational, uh, computationally efficient, so you can build a little bit deeper networks. Uh, same ideas, we also tested some ideas from, from ResNet with residual connections and also these ideas work pretty well on, on, on the sound data. Uh, so also adds, uh, adds a few percent there. Um, yeah, of course our network consists of multiple of these inception modules uh, stacked uh, upon each other, just as you would do with normal uh, convolutional layers. Um, there's another way of exploiting the fact that, uh, that the vertical location or frequency bin matters. Uh, you could also do something else that is, that is a little bit similar to the, to the thing we saw before with the max pooling, but now it has a, uh, it has a somewhat different effect. So what we do, we split the, the image in, uh, yeah, in this case in three sections, the high frequency, mid frequency and low frequency sections. and um, uh, then we, uh, we train separate networks for each of them. So we have a separate network for high frequencies with a few uh, yeah, inception or in, in spectrum uh, modules stacked together, uh, and we have them for the, for the other frequency bands too. Um, uh, in the end, we do the flatten trick as we've seen before, and we do a concatenation. It's still in the same, uh, in the same network, so we can train it in one, uh, in one model, in one go. Uh, and, it's, and, it, and we have the standard dense networks uh, at the end. So what this does, um, it actually says that, that there could be other patterns and other things happening in the higher frequencies that we don't see in the lower frequencies. And if they would be the same, they will mean a different thing. So you really exploit the fact that these are very different things going on in these, in these frequency bands. So you can do with a lot, of, uh, with a lot, less, uh, with a lot less filters. Uh, so it makes it computationally more uh, more efficient. So to summarize, um, what we did, what we did, we do for sound specificness, um, we did the flatten layer. We have the in spectrum inception-like modules, uh, and we have the split frequency bands. Um, we added to that some batch normalization and some either activations to uh, yeah to make the model perform a little bit better. So how does this uh, fit in the whole process? Because this is just the model that we've talked about. Uh, to do full uh, audio event detection, we also need some kind of uh, detection of an audio event. Um, and this is, well, this is not done using machine learning. It's just simple peak detection. 
If it's above a certain threshold, then it means we have an interesting sound, an interesting loud sound that we want to classify. Uh, that gets uh, feed into the network, we create the MEL spectrogram and the pre-processing. Uh, we have the, uh, the model that we talked about and we have as output a classified event. So this is actually how it all fits together. Uh, so main takeaways, um, we've seen that computer vision techniques work pretty good on sound. Um, uh, you can make MEL spectrograms as a, as a proper representation to make it two-dimensional, to make it work. Uh, sound, however, has some differences. I mean, it's transparent, it, it, add up, it adds up differently. Uh, the frequency precision matters, so we can exploit that fact. And the last thing, well, we've seen a lot of different ideas. I mean, they all work individually. If they add up, they also work, but there is kind of a limit uh, to that. So there are many, many ways to accomplish good performance on these, uh, on these networks. So these are a couple of ideas that you can try, and it might work better or or worse on your own data sets. Um, well, in the, uh, uh, in, in the summary of this talk, we, we promised to talk about uh, detecting emotions also uh, in customer contact centers because this is another domain that we've used the same techniques for. I don't think we have a lot of time to cover this, but I'll walk you through the basics. So what we do with uh, emotion detection uh, is that it actually works as a, as a feedback mechanism. When an agent in a uh, call center environment uh, has interactions with a customer, um, you have emotions as a, as a feedback. Are you doing well? Are you helping your, your client? Or is he becoming more and more unhappy? Uh, so these are some of the basic emotions that, uh, that you can experience. And if you add a computer into the mix that supports the agent, um, uh, you also need some kind of feedback because if you're uh, like proposing knowledge-based articles, uh, for example, to, a, to an agent to give to the customer, um, you also need some feedback mechanism. So you can have the feedback mechanism also for the machine. Um, okay, well, given, given this, what, what, can you do, what, what can you do with this as a concrete example in a, uh, in a customer contact center? Um, for example, you can do statistics on, uh, on, on different, different agents. Some people will uh, have happier customers on average than other people. And maybe if, 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 if somebody makes the, the client angry all the time, uh, maybe they need some training. So um, it also helps with that because we know from each conversation, uh, and, and in many cases those conversations are recorded. Um, uh, which ones went south, which ones uh, were really bad. So we can, we can easily look up in the database uh, which, which conversations got some emotional contact and use that for training to listen to it again together with the agent and see where we can, uh, we can, where we can improve conversation. Um, uh, for, for a live dashboard, there's also some possibilities. How are we doing as a team, as a, as a contact center team? Are we making people happy today or not happy? what is happening, and also some, some live assistance in case a conversation goes really bad, uh, a supervisor can be alerted, or you can give some other interventions. So this is what we, uh, uh, what we use it for. The, 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 the pipeline is roughly, uh, well, the, the pipeline is actually a little different than, uh, than, than, the, sound rec than the sound event detection. Uh, the sound event detection, you can use the same uh, techniques as we've uh, talked about before. Um, I must say, when we're talking about speech, there might be some specific techniques that, uh, that, that can help there because it's a little bit different domain, of course, than, uh, than sounds in, in cities. Uh, but what we're doing there is we also take the, the, the contents of the conversation into account. We do a speech-to-text uh, uh, trans, uh, transcription. Uh, we use word embeddings. Uh, and uh, then you can also stack a few convolutional networks or convolutional layers together concatenate them at the end, and we have a classified emotion as an output. So this is more in a, uh, in a research state, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this pipeline, but the basic techniques are, uh, are about the same. So, uh, yeah, this is, this is it.